We're going to close the session off for now with uh, Sam Gindon's presentation on new trends in organizing. Sam is, um, is at York University in Canada, but also spent many years with the Canadian Water Workers. His reputation is one of a key left trade union thinker, so we're very lucky to have him in the room with us to share uh, with us the benefits of his analysis, his assessment of organizing. So, over to you, Sam. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the discussions. Uh, they were great and stimulating. So uh, I'm not going to make the presentation I was thinking about making. I think I'd rather respond uh, to what was said this morning and some of what was said today. And uh, one of the particular uh, points I want to make is that uh, I want to really have a sober look at where we're at. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons for hope, there's all kinds of reasons for potential. Uh, the labor movement is fundamental to change being sustained. But I think we really have to have a sober look at the limits of uh, what's been going on. The, the main thing about the context is that since the 90s, uh, the number of workers, people who sell their labor to make a living has approximately doubled. Incredible growth. Uh, capitalism is not in crisis, it's stumbling through this crisis. All kinds of political institutions have been delegitimated, and yet the left and the labor movement haven't been able to take advantage. This is, this is the big question we have to ask, and it's been very dangerous because the right has been able to. And uh, I want to go back to how people framed the issue, which was to go back to the Golden Age. And what's significant about the Golden Age in the North, I'll come back to the South in a second, what's significant about the Golden Age in the North was two things. That what capital was able to do was to channel workers' militancy, frustrations, and goals into something that's called, that was called productivism. The idea was basically, let capital take care of growing the economy, and then you can share it. Uh, and you can share in it primarily as an individual. There will be a welfare state to kind of supplement it, but it was really essentially about, forget about controlling the economy, think about giving up your power to control things, the power of labor to do, for the power to consume as individuals. Um, and, and that was fundamental, and to pull that off, they had to smash the left, because the left was opposed to that. So this was fundamental in terms of setting the stage for what happened. And the most important thing in terms of talking about decline isn't what subsequently ends uh, up meeting with in terms of members, well, that's obviously important, it's about your organizational strength, but it was how this shaped the formation of the working class. Through this period, and with the neoliberalism really accelerating this, uh, the identity of, of workers as workers began to fade. There was a deconstruction of the class. So you were workers rather than a member of the class. And that was absolutely uh, crucial. Now, it didn't mean that there wasn't militancy in the 70s. But what we saw in the 60s and 70s was also the, mil the limits of militancy. In times of growth, uh, militancy could win all kinds of things. All of a sudden, when you get into the 80s, workers in the north are confronted with the fact that militancy isn't enough and that the capacities they developed in the earlier period, shock floor militancy, but also a lot of technical capacities, legalistic capacities, capacities to deal with uh, grievances, uh, these couldn't solve the problems that workers were facing. Capital was much more aggressive, and uh, those capacities uh, didn't solve workers' problems. And the question was, could the labor movement adapt? Could it develop new kinds of capacities? Uh, and it didn't. And the kind of things, just an extreme example of what happens in this period, where you're forcing workers to compete with each other, that becomes a dominant theme, so you're really, again, fragmenting workers, is what happened in the iconic auto industry. The auto industry where workers once thought, we don't care what happens to anybody else, we're powerful enough to shut anything down. We, uh, we don't have to care about alliances or anything else. Uh, today, the auto unions have two-tier wages. So what does that mean? It means that in order to protect what you have, you say that we will give up things for people who don't work here yet. So they don't vote. It's perfectly democratic, right? Only the people who are there vote. And you defend yourself. But the question is, what does this mean 
in terms of the possibility of regenerating and renewing unions, if young workers come in, the first thing that they experience is they can be doing the same work as somebody else right beside them, but they can't get the same wage, and that the union is part of that. And how could you possibly expect a union or unions that use two-tier systems to protect themselves and defend themselves <coughs> to do anything for precarious workers when they don't do it for people who are working beside them? In the South, there was all kinds of hope uh, through the struggles around liberation, the anti-apartheid struggles, the struggles against uh, dictatorship, uh, and there's still a legacy from that. But what is so fascinating about that is also about how much of that disappeared. As workers in the South began to be integrated into global capitalism. Now this wasn't just imposed. It was also workers and their unions thinking in terms of, well, what do we want for ourselves? It wouldn't be great if we could emulate what they've got over there in the North. That's way better than what we have right now. And the quickest way of doing that in terms of thinking about wealth, who are we going to produce for? Where are the markets? Is to say, we'll enter globalization. We'll borrow money. And again, it wasn't just that this was imposed on them. There was also uh, an interest in doing this. And of course, as somebody mentioned earlier, you can't understand this without recognizing that the problems weren't just abroad. It was also elites at home. So in the South, they began to also uh, face the same kind of problems that unions uh, in, the, in the North had, had uh, faced. And in the South, uh, although for a while it looked like the North is in decline, but the South is rising in terms of unionization, uh, what you had in the South was, first of all, it was incredibly uneven. Even through the best periods for the global South as a whole, there were all kinds of people in the global South, in all kinds of countries that weren't benefiting. But in the examples that were often used, like South Africa, or Brazil, or Venezuela, or Argentina, as was mentioned earlier by Meta, I think is how mentioned it. Meta. Uh, there's also a sense of defeat and, and what's next. And even in China, where there is all this militancy, it still raises the question of where, did this, where does this go? Because what the militancy has meant so far has been a very fragmented militancy. Now, the Communist Party has basically accepted that it will let people have their strikes at particular factories as long as they don't make links with each other. If you try to make links with each other, you will be jailed. Uh, and there's also the question of well, what are the demands? Uh, so far, very understandably, the demands of Chinese workers are to get higher consumption and therefore to try to move towards the kind of models that they've been in the North. Okay, so, so, so there's that question of what happened, but there's a more fundamental question that I want to pose. And that is, aside from what happened and thinking about what mistakes were made, there's a question of the limits of unions. And we have to really, res I think we have to take this really quite seriously. Not, not for the purpose of writing them off, but for understanding better what they can do and what they can't do. Unions aren't class organizations, even though they come out of the class. They're particular organizations. They represent particular groups of workers who have particular demands tied usually to bargaining, uh, and uh, they're defensive, and their membership is diverse. They're all, they're all over the place. You know, not, these aren't people who are joining a union the way you join a political party because you agree with a political program, like we have in, in the, the program here. Uh, and recently, even you know, forgetting when unions were organized, a lot of people, they, they have a union because it's there. There's nothing that had to be fluffed. So you have these, these organizations which are really particular organizations. And the question is, well, what can you do to make them more progressive, to, to inject the kind of things that people have been raising here? And I think what we can do is think in terms of how do you inject in them a class sensibility? I don't mean how do you make them into organizations that say, we don't care who's really paying our dues or what our members want, we're going to represent everybody. But how can you at least bring in the idea of class and try to show that it actually matters concretely if you think in terms of class, if you start thinking in terms of class the way we've lost? How do you create spaces and fight to create spaces in unions that you can raise questions of, uh, questions of socialism, questions of capitalism, uh, and, and those kinds of questions which are also linked to strategic questions? How do you find ways of constantly trying to balance uh, the immediate needs of the members and the long term. 
Because workers are they're trying to survive. They're looking at the immediate. The long term is far away. How do you balance these things? How do you build capacities now so you can say, look, we may not have a lot of choices now, but to have choices in the future, we have to think about building capacities. So how does that happen? Now, one of the things that makes that easier to start talking about is the polarization of options. There really isn't any neat middle ground now to join. You can't say to workers, take it easy, just join with management, things will be fine. That doesn't work. All those, you know, what Tina really came to mean is that there's no, there is no alternative except to challenge this, except to build independent organizations and to become more radical. There's no way of dealing with these things unless we're prepared to be more radical. Now, what does more radical mean uh, in a way that's concrete and not just rhetorical? So, for example, most unions will now accept the idea that, public sector unions, for example, that unless we actually speak for the public as a whole, unless we play a leadership role and say, we actually represent the services, we'll be isolated. We won't win anything, mm -hmm. unless that's a starting point. Now, the trouble with recognizing that is that it's not good enough. You can't put up billboards and say, we love you, public. You actually have to demonstrate that you mean it. You have to actually put on the bargaining table public demands, whether it's uh, sm smaller class size if you're in the education sector, whether in the healthcare sector it's, uh, it's talking, of, uh, talking about uh, hospital safety, etc. You have to be able to raise the larger issues. You have to be able to put them on the bargaining table. And it's like an investment. You're putting it on the bargaining table to get the public on your side and be ready to strike over it. Now, to pull off those kinds of things means you have to change everything about your union. These aren't just policies and new tactics. Now you have to think about what do we put our money into? What does our staff do? How do we relate to the community if we're teachers? Uh, what do we train everybody for? How do we uh, deal with the fact that our staff are all spending most of their time on grievances, but we want them to be organizers? You have to begin to ask all those questions, and you have to be able to mobilize your members, because they're not going to let you do these things if you're not dealing with their issues, and because you desperately need them to be organizers. You can only do these things because they're so labor intensive if you have their mem the members. Uh, in the private sector, <coughs> uh, we have to recognize that we can't talk about saving jobs, and we can't talk about the environment and dealing with the environment and jobs <coughs> unless we talk about some form of planning. We can't solve the environmental problem just by you know, local solutions. There has to be some kind of control over private property. It has to be linked to planning. And if you tell workers not to worry about it because there'll be a just transition, workers will just shrug. You don't have the power to implement a just transition. What does that mean when you say that? It's just a slogan. So you have to be able to start putting the question of planning on the agenda. And when you put the question of planning on the agenda, you're immediately starting to cha channel, challenge uh, private property rights. Uh, one other thing I want to emphasize that uh, uh, was emphasized in the, in the talk yesterday uh, was one of the things that happened in the global south was the struggle, especially in Latin America but elsewhere, was identified as a struggle against neoliberalism. And what, what that was missing as, how do I say, and as Bjorn, is that right? Close enough? And as Bjorn said, was that there's only one kind of capitalism today. The idea that Latin America could suddenly decide we want to be like Sweden, and Sweden isn't even like Sweden anymore, that wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> and this affects how you develop your strategy. If you think that it's just neoliberalism, that affects how you organize, that affects how deep things have to get. So you have to think about that. Now, the, the big question this raises isn't that unions aren't important. They're still so fundamental. They have resources, they have organization, they have economic leverage. Uh, and even compared to the excitement about youth, I mean, the excitement about youth, yes, we should be excited. There is all this energy out there. There is all this creativity out there. These are people who have to be brought in. But it's also been thin. You know, what Occupy was able to do was to say, look, if you start talking about uh, the 1%, people are actually going to be sympathetic. If you take over a public space, people are really they didn't attack us. That's wonderful. But what Occupy couldn't do was outreach. 
We couldn't figure out how you actually get to work or so you could start taking over factories and offices and hospitals. And that's the kind of thing that would have happened. And one of the things that's happening with youth, in spite of all the criticism of electoral politics and a lot of the youth movements uh, being opposed to electoral politics, one of the most significant shifts that's happened is that people have begun to see the limits of protest. And they've begun to see the necessity of entering the state, which means that they get very interested in a Corbyn or a Sanders, even though they're doing it within not new parties, but the Democratic Party or the Labour Party. But again, it's still thin. It's still looking for a shortcut of election. <coughs> it's optimistic, but then the question really is, well, how do you really build something out of it? And that's going to be the question. And that really requires organizing at the base. So everybody, we all talk about we have to organize at the base, we have to change unions, this is what we should do. Well, how does this happen? And this is what we really have to confront. Who is going to do this? Who is going to make a commitment to go into the unions and do these things? And it's only socialists who will do this. You know, there'll be the odd person who gets angry and will do it for a while, and the odd person will get angry and he'll learn things from it and stick with it and become a socialist. But we're really talking about the necessity of but there being socialists everywhere and talking about class and getting workers to see, as I think you said earlier, when you talk about class, you're talking about all dimensions of workers' lives. That's why you want to organize in the community. You're talking about the whole class. That's why when you organize precarious workers, you don't go to your members and say, we have to put, invest money into getting precarious workers because we'll get more dues. You have to say it's because we'll, we're going to organize the working class. We're going to build a class. And if we can't build a class, we're going to be screwed. <laughs> this is what you're saying. This is why, you know, you, can't, you have to have people who are saying to their unions, why aren't we organizing all the fast food workers in our community? You know, the myth of globalization is you can't do anything. We still have public sector workers who can't be moved. We still generally can't be moved. We still have retail sector workers. We still have construction workers. Why are we so weak in those sectors? Why don't we go into a community that's a real working class community and say, we're going to start servicing all the fast food workers in the city. And as we service them and get connections, we start talking about unions. But we're going to tell them we're doing it anyways, before they pay dues, or maybe if they pay a token. Well, the reason that doesn't happen is because unions compete with each other. They're not going to do this if someone else is going to get the numbers. So the question is, well, how do you go in and fight for all these things? And if you're a socialist doing this individually, you're not going to last long. It's demoralizing. And that's why we have to think about the organizational capacity beyond unions. We have to, have to think about structures that have their feet inside unions, and outside unions. So they're not just trapped by thinking just about the union, but they're grounded. Now when you start thinking about those kinds of organizations, you're starting to move to the question of, well, is this a socialist organization? How would this relate to the state? And raising those questions. Um, I can see the time thing, and people are going to get, get hungry. I want to flag one other thing, which doesn't have anything to do with directly what I was asked to talk about. <laughs> but uh, well, two things. One is that when we think about what's the barrier to organizing uh, and to people being active, uh, we come up with all kinds of reasons like union bureaucracy, uh, people are, don't care, whatever it is. But I think the biggest barrier is that they don't have structures to fight through that seem that they can change the world. It used to be that they used to have to buy off the working class. They don't have to buy it off anymore. They can just say, you don't like it tough. That's all there is. And until we create structures that workers can believe it matters, instead of just going to a meeting, it matters if you join these structures. You can actually build something. We won't get anywhere. And the second question is this question of the state. We have to get beyond this frustration with we elect somebody and then nothing happens, and then we think, well, we should have a little more control over it. We have to be clearer on what we're trying to do. We're not just trying to become a government, as I think you were saying yesterday. You know, these are capitalist states. The capacities they have are for running capitalist societies. The question is, can you get into the state and transform the state? Can we imagine a different kind of state that develops new capacities that are suitable and support and facilitate the democratization of everything? That if workers take over a factory that's about to close, it is a state that will be able to move in and give them technical expertise that will say, look, we can actually buy this product because we have a plan about how this could fit into something larger. Uh, we can give you financing. 
And so we have to think through, and it's a longer question about what would it mean to transform this thing? Because if all we're going to do is have this, you know, trading one party for another party, all we're going to do is demoralize people and really be defeated. Okay. Just a few minutes, really, before lunch. So, can we? Uh, has anybody got any burning questions or things that just have to get out there? So, Ian, do you want to go first? Yeah, just a quick one. I'm glad that was video because um, I'm going to show it to my students because you kind of captured in a few minutes what it would take normally hours to, um, to portray. Just very quickly, I think for me, a lot of what you've said is encapsulated in some of the work. We'll be trying to do at Ruskin College with trade unions around uh, co-ops and <coughs> um, Particularly to return to a debate about workers' control. But one of the things that confuses me is I sat next to a colleague from Unison, which has a very ambivalent policy around cooperatives. Yet the labour movement came out of a trade union movement, a cooperative movement, and a political movement. It's from where we came. So for me, what, what's represented a lot in what you've just said, in the context of the UK at least, is an ambivalence on the part of the major unions to uh, consider uh, fully and properly uh, what workers' control could mean in the context. That point you made before about the public sector as an option. But thank you very much for that um, summary. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I've got Khaled and then I've got Joshua. Can I, and can, can I see if there's, a, if there's a woman comrade who wants to ask a question or say something? Because we have five guys. And no time. <laughs> okay. Sam, do you want, you want to respond? No, no, I, I, I don't want to take other people's time. Right? I'd like to respond. Yeah, yeah you'll have to rather wait or do it later in the okay. program. <coughs> we'll come back to you. Khaled, you're next. Uh, um, yeah. For me, the bigger question is what were the unions in not doing when the capital was booming? Uh, what were they thinking? The, the, the members were losing jobs there, and the capital was moving to south to exploit more workers. What was the role of union at that time? And when the capital moved to global south, the world, global south is very diverse. There are countries in global south where there is union movement in the private sector. And then there are countries where there is no union movement in the private sector. There are only big public sector unions. <coughs> and these, the global, uh, the, the capital, when they moved to Global South, they not only uh, were able to change the labor laws in those countries, but they were able to, to replace the whole labor inspection regime. There is private labor inspection system going on, especially in the garment industry. And the role of the state in the global south has been diminished to, to zero when it comes to the labor rights. And here comes the question of solidarity. Now, when these workers are being exploited in global south, what is the level of solidarity among the unions? There are organizing efforts going on in the global south. There are big accidents happening in the Global South. The, the, the global unions are moving towards that, but what is the role of building the general trade units from the grassroots level? That is still missing. So the responsibility, first of all, from doing nothing, when the capital was moving there and when the workers exploited there, still there is no uh, effective uh, 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 solidarity and the responsibility for me sitting in global south i, I think there is more responsibility uh, uh, upon the unions in north as it is on the leadership of the south union as well but i think we have to think about that question how to build a strong solidarity uh, when the workers are being exploited now in global south thank you Khaled. Yeah. i see two more and then i think we should close it there's a comrade at the back behind Khaled had his hand up no no okay don't see any more nick and then we two. Then we were close. I only want to say you wanted a woman to contribute. Yes. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam, you can have a lift with me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that contribution. I learned all this from her whilst oh, she gave me a lift. Yeah. I'm sorry, I thought it was you, Joshua. Thank you.
Okay. Okay. We do have two more. Joshua, then, and then, very, very then we'll ask Sam to respond. Thanks for that presentation, Sam. It raised a lot more questions than answers, which is probably what we need at this point in time. But one of the more, uh, I just want to add another question to that. And, and your point about we need to build organizations that are beyond unions is really interesting. Because last time I was here, Dan Gillian was saying that the unions are the first line and last line of defense of the working class. Now you're calling for you know, an organization beyond the unions. My question is, how do we build that without turning it into another elitist organization that would run like, you know, a Leninist banger. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I mean, just to, 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 to echo what you're saying, I think... Introduce yourself. I did, totally. Oh, wow. Nicola from South Africa. Um, I'm just thinking okay, about this question of the state that you were raising. It seems to me that at the moment, in a lot of movements that are very bottom up in Le Bou in France, for there was, there are very interesting initiatives by, let's say, doctors who are experiencing the full force of the neoliberal restructuring of public health, who are trying to think about ways to change the way in which healthcare is provided, largely because they want to defend it, and nurses as well, and teachers. Um, but because of the fears that, that you're talking about, the fears of the mistakes of the past of these large organizations, um, which I think are sometimes fears that are based on a blanket rejection rather than sometimes a selective analysis of, of what went wrong and what perhaps went right. Uh, there is no coordinating mechanism between those struggles, those very atomizing, very progressive struggles, which I think are very inspiring, but as I saw very clearly in Paris, peter out after a while, because people don't have the resources and the energy to continue coming every night and discussing. And anyway, they discuss, they agree on an agenda, who takes it forward? Who's going to reform public health in France and stop the encroachment of, uh, of private companies? <coughs> And, and so what I'm just thinking, you know, the, the, the need for some kind of coordination mechanism is very clear, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how it could work and the role unions could have in this, uh, perhaps more concretely than what you, you pointed to. Okay, we'll come back to Sam, and obviously a lot of these themes are going to be picked up later on today and throughout the summer school, so up to you. Six seconds for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of some more questions while they were being asked. Uh, I, I just want to say, if people are really interested in... Uh, in organizing models, one of the things they should really look at is the Chicago teachers. Can you speak up? Sam? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Stand up, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if people are interested in organizing models uh, that are, you know, very creative and have been quite successful, they should look at uh, the Chicago teachers, which has been really uh, well documented. Uh, and I can pass on stuff if people want it, and it's available on the net. But one of the interesting things about it is that they did everything right. They really got the parents on side. They shifted parents from thinking that teachers and unions were the barrier to education to actually understanding that uh, teachers were an ally and that the barriers were that nobody gave a, nobody cared about the kids in the black ghettos at all. Uh, but the, but the, the other point I just want to flag is after they won their strike, the city closed 50 schools. And again, it raises the question about you have these struggles and you might lose them. And the question isn't, well, that was a bad strategy. The question is, what do we have to do beyond what we did to deal with this? Uh, the question of co-ops, uh, two things I'd say about co-ops. One is, uh, I, I don't think that they're an agent for transformation. Because you can't just start these small things and not challenge where power is really lying and leave it aside and think that you can solve the problem there. But co-ops can play a very important role if they're politicized. Because if they're not, then they're just another economic business that has to compete with other businesses. But if you say we're forming a co-op, and when you buy from the co-op, some of the money is going to go into organizers who are going to be part of left campaigns or socialist campaigns, then it's a different kind of a co-op. If you're going to say that the space of the co-op is going to be used for education, when we talk about property rights and different forms of property, uh, then you can do it. Um, capital moving to the south. Look, I, I think one of the most important things about the north-south relationship is that the south should always be pushing the north. But it has to recognize, if the north doesn't even have enough strength to defend itself in the most minor ways, which it, you know, the unions right now haven't even been able to defend their wages and pensions or their jobs, 
they're not going to be able to block the movement of capital. I mean, we just we just have to understand that the unions are so weak that they can't do that. That doesn't mean that you can't do solidarity work. You know, we made you know there's all kinds of campaigns about investment in South Africa. Uh, we put we we've got great we had great education uh, great health and safety programs that were com computerized. We made sure that we could distribute that throughout Central America. Uh, we did educational work. <coughs> that was linked to what the kind of education people wanted. So there's always things that you can do. There's something you can do in the middle of a strike. Mexican workers were on strike in Hermosilla. You know, we could intervene in Canada. But there's just a limit when you have these kinds of weak organizations. That's why the fundamental thing for us, first of all, is we have to build the strength here, because otherwise we can't help anybody. But we always have to build it with that kind of internationalist sensibility. And that's very important. And that's why that kind of international work, which probably does minor things, does have an important educational thing about class. Uh, the Leninist question. Uh, <laughs> look. Lunch. Uh, <laughs> if, if, you know, if we want to be pure, we can't get engaged in trying to change the world. Trying to get in engaged in changing the world is not only full of compromises, but it's also full of discovering and inventing things that haven't been discovered before. So things we haven't known how to do yet, we, we have to figure them out. And I think what Nicholas said is absolutely right. We can't say, well, socialist party screwed up before, so we're not going to think about a socialist party. We have to try to understand why that happened and do it differently. Same with unions, of course. So that's, uh, you know, I, you know it's, it's a waffle. Uh, but I think that's the truth. I think we really have to appreciate what we're up against. Um, on some of the questions about uh, the state, uh, I don't know if it's, it's what you're getting at. Uh, you know, there's a question of what would you do if you were in the state. So for example, we could imagine public sector workers uh, saying that we want to form councils, like a healthcare council or an education council, with uh, uh, their clients with people in the private sector. So what you have is, is a new institution in the state linked to things that are going on outside the state and that are autonomous. You're not going to run them, but you know they're going to have their input. They're going to be democratic. So you can start thinking about, well, what would it mean? What, what are some examples of doing this? It's hard to do when you're not uh, inside the state. You can still argue. There's, nothing, you know, there's no reason why uh, teachers couldn't argue we want to counsel. We want to meet with people in the education department. We want to have some input into how they're structuring things. And we want parents to be there, not just a union. We recognize it's a larger agenda. But that's why you have to start. You know, you, you, you always come up against the limits of doing things under capitalism, especially now. And that's what raises the question of we have to think about getting into the state, but getting into the state for the purpose of transforming it and introducing all kinds of new capacities that it never had to deliver. Well, you know, it's a bureaucratic state because it has to be able to run a capitalist economy uh, and, uh, you know, so that capitalists can accumulate. It's not a state that's always trying to figure out, geez, how can we democratize these things so that people have new capacities and can control things? Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you.